I guess from a high level view, um, traditionally the way that it was structured in Europe is that you had um, a right society that represented mechanicals and performance in each territory and if you needed to get licenses you would go territory by territory to clear that. Um, I think that the digital world kind of changes that because you're talking about distribution that goes across borders and um, that um, created a need for a kind of one stop, stop shopping solution. And various companies through um, alliances and partnerships, the societies with various major uh, publishers have created entities like Cellus and a whole host of other companies um, with acronyms that I can't even remember what they stand for. Um, and the goal is to offer pan-European licensing. I think that the problem is that um, not, not a single one of them can offer all of the content that a licensee would need. So you could wind up in a situation where you would have to go to multiple entities to get all of the content that you need for pan-European licensing, um, which creates another, another problem. I, I think long term, having the competition is probably good, but short term is probably very confusing. I think uh, compounding that is that the licensing authority of some of these company, these entities is being challenged in certain territories. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a wait and see to see how that plays out. You know, if you look at the United States, what Maurice was mentioning, it's, it's pretty disruptive where you have quite a few thousand publishers that are, way, you know, a lot, many of them are affiliated with Harry Fox, but then there's thousands of others. But in Europe, in the 27 states, as, as complex as it may seem, it's not unrealistic to do business and iTunes is in there and uh, Seven Digital, I believe, and they've obtained those licenses. It's challenging, but like any, you know, uh, uh, change in the territories, the, the old model was accustomed to territorial licensing. The French handled France, the, the Germans handled Germany, and, you know, and, and in the UK, the, 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 the British handled the UK markets. But as the digitalization of music has come forth, it's now, you know, defi you know looking at it from a collective as the EU and how can one entity pan European license, but the, the subdivision has now come with these pedals and cellists and impels and ice and all these uh, subsets of these societies or offshoots of the publishers. It's a little bit confusing, but I think it's, it's, it's stabilizing and I think that it, it is progressing and there's standards that, you know, you know, Harry Fox and our company Vice was part of with DDEX to impl implement an account and pay back to the proper authors and publishers, but I think it's getting better. But it, remember you said it is challenging, but it's not unrealistic where it was 10 years ago, and, and the United States is a little bit still disruptive, you know, going forward. Patrick, you've done a lot of uh, work with your company through, uh, uh, or to, to issue, or to uh, take advantage of the compulsory license in the United States. you want to talk a little bit about that, about how that's working for you in, in this country? Sure. The, so everyone knows the compulsory licensing is, you know, part of the copyright law. It's, it's an ability for licensees to send uh, a notice to a copyright owner or administrator that they would like to use a work that's been published or put for sale in the United States. And, and, and typically the permission isn't required, you just would send a notice. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's something that hasn't been done in, in the past in a large quantifiable way because it was, you know, uh, the, 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 the amount of publishers and songwriters that exist and also from the, the, the non-technical capabilities. But as we've evolved um, from a technology perspective and the data has been aggregated and, you know, compiled collectively many times over, it's been more of a push for, you know, licensees that would in effect pursue the NOI process where they send compulsory notices to publishers, and, you know, I, and I think it's not something that I think everybody would want to do. It's sometimes it's the only choice you have where you have many uh, songwriters and publishers that refuse to negotiate a license when they commercially want to control the marketplace, um, and then you have to, in fact, send an NOI. So I think there's a balance in the market. We, we are pushing out, um, you know, several million NOIs now monthly and accounting back to the copyright owners, and it's really being dictated by, um, you know, that those types of publishers and songwriters that refuse to directly negotiate our license.
And then on the other side, it's, you know, it's those, you know, that just choose, we don't want to negotiate with 77,000 rights holders or ask permission at the risk that they say no and then they can sue you. So there's a balance, you know, in the marketplace. We will issue NOIs as well um, to plug the hole at the end of the process, but our concern is that NOIs are very disruptive to publishers. They're actually burdensome and, and expensive to licensees as well. And it doesn't really solve the problem of streamlining, uh, dealing with all of this data and, and getting transactions done quickly and properly. Um, so there are many out there that will come to you and tell you that the easiest way for you to get licensed is to flood the market with NOIs because, oh, it's so hard to figure out who owns what. It's not and don't pay for that. One of the, the issues that a lot of publishers are concerned about is the fact that, that we don't have, when you're in a pass-through situation, it's not having direct audit rights. And you're relying on the labels to, to, do, to audit the services themselves, but you don't have the data. You're not getting any direct data. Right. Um, which is problematic. You don't have a set of checks and balances. Um, so we call that, in, in my house, we call that the Blanche Dubois method of accounting, which is that you rely on the kindness of strangers. Is, uh, Chris, isn't, isn't that really what's happening with the NOIs? I mean, uh, you know, in, in, in the audit world, um, you know, I'm hard pressed to figure out in, in, in this pass-through, it's worse. In the NOIs, how on earth is anybody who's uh, received an NOI and has been paid on an NOI, you know, going to confirm the accuracy of what's been reported on their statements? I mean, as an auditor, I think the NOIs are horrible. Um, I mean, you, you think about what goes on with an NOI. Um, you've got to rely on somebody else telling you um, how much they use, and you've got, to, you've got to trust them. You know, there's a missing element. You know, you can trust, but you've got to be able to verify. There seem to be these wild disparities out there, um, even, even in situations where there are licenses. So, I mean, what, what's been your experience? I mean, do you think that there, there is... Uh, there's a lot of money floating around there in the system that just hasn't been collected, or I, are you satisfied with the well, way you've been treated? Well, I think there, there are on there. There is money floating out there. I think one of the one of the biggest problems is you're getting you still get we're still in the position where we're getting a lot of license uh, potential licensees coming in after the fact, and you'll even notice that there is some are even brazen enough to put in a release put in release language in their in their licenses that they send to you, and it's like you go well. Doesn't that make you think that you've been, you've been out exploiting in, in the interim? Um, but I think there are, there are more and more people that are stepping up to the plate and trying to, because the publishers really do, do want to be, be partners with the digital companies. It's, we're not the big, bad, ugly, you know, scary, scary person that doesn't, want to, that doesn't want to have deals. I think they were being a lot more creative in terms of trying to, to step up to the table. But it, one of the areas that we see, uh, lyrics is a great example. Um, lyrics are the second most searched item on the internet, and you know that the majority of sites and apps out there that are that are uh, posting lyrics are not licensed. That that's a big issue. There are a lot more works out there than than I ever would have imagined that have never been registered with anyone. Right. And as you move into technologies and distribution delivery systems that are non-traditional um, and you move into that long tail as you hear you're going to find more and more of those and how do you determine who those owners are and how do you determine where that music came from there's that sen sense that if something is at in the least difficult then I ought to be able to just do it you know kind of for free or not pay anybody or just kind of get it done or get a compulsory license or get an extended collective license, which is what we deal with here. Um, and that, that really hasn't been the case, at least in the, in the United States, um, uh, and probably won't be in the rest of the world uh, uh, either.